complicated, you know, man. I got down with Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man. Then you get to one side, then you like the rest of it. If you share my lack of faith in our health system, you should take control of your well being. Building resilience and maintaining good health for the long term needs to be a priority. Axios Remote Fitness Coaching offers one stop expert advice on training, diet, and lifestyle. You can purchase customized workout plans for strength training or structured exercise. If you're serious about maximizing your potential, you can book time with a coach or customize your routine and get video feedback on your performance. I know the owner, and he's one of us. Visit Axios and support those who support the show. Follow the link in the description to become a man of action with Axios. No one blames you for being weak, but it's your fault if you stay that way. All right, Paul Fahrenheit, welcome back to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing, man? Hey, thank you very much, Mr. Burden. Um, it's a pleasure to be a regularly recurring guest on this show. I take great pride in the fact of knowing that I was your first ever guest, seeing what this has turned into. Yeah, thanks, man. I I, uh, I, I was I was talking about this the other day uh, during the you know the the long uh, long benefit stream, but I, I'm really happy with the the kind of like the stable of recurring guests. You know, there's kind of four of you who have come on, you know, more than about three or four times. You know, you, Thomas, uh, you know, Bagby, and uh, Luthemplar, Cringe Walker. And those are ve- those are four very different people, but I don't think I could pick, you know, four better recurring guests. So I'm happy to have you back on, man. Four, four very good friends of mine, uh, four people I have met IRL, um, and, you know, the uh, lovely gentleman could not give a higher endorsement of any of them. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know... To be honest, it, it it speaks to your character that these are the kinds of people. There's four of I think I think four of the greatest geniuses that our side has to offer. Well, not including myself. I apologize. Three of the greatest geniuses that this um, um that this side has to offer, and then my my stupid ass uh, kind of tagging along. Um, you know, it, it really does speak to your character that you can you can attract that that quality of people, and I think all the success your show has is is totally deserved. Well, thanks, man. I mean, uh, to me, because uh, we're just about almost at the uh, or, or the one year anniversary of uh, of you and I speaking, you know, and actually, oh, we're also right. almost at episode one hundred. I'm going to see if I can get those to line up. It, it won't quite <laughs> line up, but you know, to to satisfy my number of autism, I think I might. But uh. You know, I've just kind of been doing a you know a retrospective thinking back on it. And uh, obviously there's there's a limited pool of success that is the you know the radical right, so to speak, but I'm pretty happy with how it's gone. You know, I'm still here, I've been kicked off, haven't been fired yet, you know, so here's hoping it's gonna go better for a little bit. Yeah, that's true. And to to be honest, part of me has come into the opinion that, you know, the the pseudonyms we have the noms de guerre whatever i think we've developed our discourse to such a point we've developed our sort of modes of survival our survival mechanisms to such a point where um you know doxing doesn't really mean anything that it used to i'm not i'm not now pause don't go dox yourself don't go dox other people this is not an endorsement do not do not do this um i i i don't you know i don't recommend it that being said I think that that we've kind of society has shifted towards us and we have changed ourselves and made enough compromises with some weird things we used to believe to bring ourselves close enough to society that I feel like that we're, we're starting to see a little bit of overlap. A lot of our points, um, there's less and less time between us talking about a point on right wing Twitter and say Tucker Carlson mentioning it on Tucker Carlson tonight or whatever. Right. So the the dissident right has been unbelievably successful um, in shifting the Overton window toward of, of wider society towards us. And now it's on us because, believe it or not, we're here to compromise. Uh, if, if unless you want to stay locked in your corner of the Internet, we're here to compromise with them. Um, um, with regular society, at least enough so that we can be deemed as like adjacent to legitimate you know what i mean right and i think the advantage the advantage that we we have is essentially as people who are on the radical right but can kind of keep it in our pants to put it uh you know rather vulgarly right is that to me i always look at you know certain parts of 
the right who essentially can't go, you know, five seconds without saying something edgy, you know, without referencing some uh, historical tragedy or, you know, some type of thing like that. And, uh, you know, that kind of like shock jock instinct. And to me, that's, it's hard for me to tell how much of that is genuinely political and how much of that is essentially just pure, you know, like anarchic energy. Because I think that, you know, we on the right have kind of ridden in that wave. Like that what's, that's what meme culture was. And I think that that's still useful sometimes, but I think that it, it definitely comes down to the, to the question of essentially like, well, why are we here? You know, like, what do we want? And if we want to just be edgy forever to just like, you know, maximize the amount of fun we can have. Well, okay. Like that's, that's a game, but that, that game isn't politics. And to me, like if, if you're actually serious about saying like, well, I'm unhappy with the state of things, I want them changed. Well, then you are going to have to make compromises. That's how the real world works. And, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I don't mean to, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you going to say something else? No, no. I was just going to uh, add a concluding sentence. But. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, no, you're correct. And, you know, being edgy, it, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of changed. All right. You know, it used to be it used to be that that saying the N word was edgy. Now, I think more or less all of us have like kind of trained ourselves to not even flinch when someone says a hard R when even, you know, even me personally at, towards the beginning of my time in the DR, that cultural coding was just so inbuilt that I, I would just flinch when I heard people saying it um, unconsciously. I'm sure I, I don't know if you've had similar experiences now. It's just kind of like you know, and, and, and that's the thing, like, like, that's not what we're talking about. And really, that's, that's, that's what I'm a, what is it? That's, that's what begins and ends with being edgy. All right. Respectability. Respectability is a mask and a cologne that will hide all sorts of scents. All right. And I'm, I mean, scents in the C or in the S C E N T S rather. Um, and, 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 and will kind of allow us to slip our ideas kind of under the nose of, of the sort of cultural monitors. And the, I think what the final victory of the dissident right is going to be is, is, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if the, uh, put me in the grave if, if, if this day does happen, but um, uh, is the, is the day where you can pretty much say the N word in public and not have anyone really care. Um, because that's kind of like that's kind of like the defeat. I think I think that's the biggest microcosm. That's the defeat of sort of the progressive thought regime of of your of the K lines that they have spent building within us for several years. And you know, if you can counteract if you if you can counteract those K lines that they've built, you know, a, 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 to the point where you can say some a word like that or a slur like that in public and not have anyone really care um, because they're, they're worrying about other things and have other things become slurs like communist or whatever. That's going to be our sort of total, not just cultural victory, but like victory of thought. Well, weirdly, this is one of the things that I think is actually kind of a, a blessing about our generation. Because on one hand, our generation is the most paused generation in history. I mean, without a doubt, just, I mean, the amount of, the amount of completely normal women who are bisexual it is off the charts when it comes to Gen Z women. That's not my point, but there is, there is an advantage in the sense that the, the massive ideological historical hooks that our grandparents and parents had jammed deep inside of our brains by virtue of the fact that the internet was decentralized and there is no one common Gen Z culture, it, well, it, it's much less, it's much less efficacious. It doesn't, those hooks aren't in us as deep. Now there are different problems. That's not my point, but I think of specifically, uh, and, I, and I'm speaking vaguely here, but kind of the myths of the 20th century, right? The kind of the, the, the very stereotypical, you know, like, baby boomer, John Wayne, or Forrest Gump view of history. Those are not symbols that are resonant anymore. And, and some of that is demographic, you know, when it comes to people who just weren't in the country for that. But I do think that the, the same ideological tools are kind of losing their, their potency. They've been over deployed. And so that, 
that 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 feeling where you're saying that we have not only won the political war, but we won the the, the war of ideas. You know that our ideas, you know, make up the null state. I, I think is a is a good victory condition. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, it's also kind of the indicator that you know we are uh, the man, as it were. You know, the, uh, the the proverbial man that the left talks about. And um, I'm not going to cap to you. Um, we're, we all basically talk like we're new leftists. It's just our cultural issues are slightly different, but we think and talk and, 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 you know, act in a way very similar to how the new leftists did in the late sixties and early seventies. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that's like, you know, an endorsement of the new leftists. They're just like the, the, the most recent kind of iteration of a, what you could call an out group managing to kind of scheme their way into power or at least like at least position themselves properly so that the rising tide and the and the sort of shifting of the zeitgeist they could kind of get right in at it and um uh and you know place themselves place themselves in important in important positions and important cultural nodes and culture production and that's why they they control all the you know that's what that's why millennials are basically millennials are the fruit are the flowering of the ascendancy of the new left we all know what millennial culture is it's those weird hats that they have that they wear it's those um, um you know it's avocado toast it's it's you know what is it? Progressive morality. It's, it's, you know, generally you know, the nascent, the nascent um, pride stuff and all of that as like a, as like a culturally ascendant force as millennial culture, man. And that's just the flowering of the, of the new left and their consequences. You know, the, the, the general acceptance of Marxism as the, you know, I, I remember to this day, you know, growing up, you know, people would say, Oh, Marxism is the perfect system. The problem is, is that humans are this, 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 this. And, you know, and, and, and I don't know, um, but I will say this uh, because I'm a Mr. Paul W. Hall just uh, asked a pretty good question. I want to directly answer it. He said, did the new left truly win, though, or do they just get co-opted and cucked to progressive liberals? Progressive liberals are what the new left became, my big man. You know, they, they got into power and they mellowed out. And that that is the consequence of them. You know, that, you know, you could maybe draw traditions outside of them, but like progressive liberals are, are pretty much what the new left has dissipated into. And well, and that's just I, I would make the argument that that is, that is simply the nature of power, right? It, is that as a, you know, as a, as a group, you know, enters into power as this kind of like, you know, vital, you know, creative force it kind of stultifies and, you know, ossifies. So, so the classic example, right, is 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 basically the entire like, you know, the entire part of Chinese history where they were regularly getting raided by the Mongols, you know, where essentially these like you know vitalistic you know steppe nomads would come in, you know, essentially overturn the social order, and then three generations later, new steppe nomads would do the same thing, and the people that they came to turn out, well, they had effectively just become you know a mirror image of the Chinese culture. And my point in this is not to you know make some broader point about Chinese culture. It was just a you know a silly example off the top of my head. But my point is that power power tends to de-radicalize you, like radicals in in the way that in the way that you know when you look at communist leadership, you know by the 1950s, you know it's still brutal, it's still awful, but it doesn't really look like a bunch of, you know, Bolshevik student revolutionaries anymore. I would argue that, that is simply like the path to power. But anyway, I, I interrupted you. No, I mean, you know, it's it's the eternal cycle of um, um real shit creates real homies. Real homies be straight chillin. Uh, straight chillin makes bitch homies. Bitch homies start some real shit. You know, that's the that's the inescapable. I I, I had to replace a word because it's YouTube. Um, of course, of course. You know, you know, you know. That's just the inescapable cycle. Like, like that's kind of just just it's it's gotten to the point where it's like where it's like it's just a, an un an unassailable fact of reality. You know, we live in a world. People get all all in the cyclical history and stuff. And I was at one point. That's kind of the horse I rode in on was sort of Spenglerian cyclical history. Um, but you know, I mean, we live in cycles of cycles. Um, you know, it, it's it circles all the way down. Everywhere you look, it's a cycle. 
And so it's like, even, even within a sort of certain phase, you see phases within that phase, like, you know, the, the new left taking power is simply one chapter in the whole story of global communism. And that, that began, you know, not just with Marx, but before and all that other stuff, like, 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 you know, so yeah, like, like, like it doesn't matter. You're not immune to it. You're not immune to the way things go. You're not immune to like, you know, you're not immune to what has happened to everything that came before you. Um, and I don't want to get into metaphysics or some shit, but that's one of the big strengths, honestly, that the dissident right has. And, you know, all the, all the associated milieu is historical literacy. We're all very historically literate, way more than pretty much any other group in the country and in, in the entire West. Um, you know, we are, we are, we are just like, like, like we understand what history is. Problem is a lot of us kind of go a bit too far and start worshiping history as an idol, which is what paganism is, in my opinion. I'm not going to get too much into that. Um, but like, like hi history, history is just kind of a series of signposts and symbols to sort of, uh, to sort of, I guess you should say, orient you to the proper world. Um, and you know, m m Mr. Burden, you know, I, I like the flow of this conversation. I have fucking like two pages worth of worth of shit to talk about, and something on this. Yeah, page sure. Let's kinda, go ahead. Yeah, something that's on the on this page that kind of relates to what we're talking about, though, with you know the, the new left and and our sort of shifting. So Nick Land, all right, you know him, you love him. He was the first of us. He was the best of us. Um, you know, he is he is probably the greatest intellect. He's one of the maybe three people who will be remembered that were a part of the quote unquote dissident Twitter right. Um, BAP may or may not be another one. Thomas may or may not be another one. Um, it just, it just, uh, it just depends. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. But the thing he's, he's been talking a lot about recently is what you would call the English canon, right? The English canon and this idea of solemn providence and all of that. And w one point that someone, someone made, a mutual friend of ours made, is that Marx, Karl Marx, is an unequivocal part of the English canon. Um, and when, when, when he said that, you know, I, I've read a little bit of Marx, but I haven't like slogged through Das Kapital. Um, but when he said that, I kind of realized the inherent truth of it. Well, I find myself in agreement because... If you consider the the canon, right, to essentially be one long continuous conversation, right, the the dialectic, th then to be honest, like regardless of your opinions on you know the application of Marx, you have to admit that well, there's an awful lot that has been written in response to him, and without understanding that, you know, without understanding that kind of like you know major brick in the wall so to speak the whole, the whole thing kind of loses its it loses its shape and one of the things that a truly liberal and i mean this in in the older sense of the word education afforded you know a man was it was a sense of that great conversation right so when you read the western canon you got a sense of the flow of ideas over time and, and so to me it's why i was very lucky to have good history professors to have good you know professors of literature who explained to me that no 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 this is not an isolated event this is not an isolated idea it's in response to this great you know this canon right and so at least on that basis i find myself in in full agreement to your to your you know to your point about marx but carry on you were you were you were addressing something that land said i believe well, you know, it, it's not so much land. It's kind of, I mean, he's kind of the great initiator of it, and he's talked a lot about it. This is more so the the the, the milieu, the couple of thinkers that I kind of hang around in various esoteric Telegram chats, who you could call, who you could call, uh, perfidious Albion's uh, top guys, top gang for for the eternal Anglo, um, simply because it is their language. It is their language that um uh, that we all speak, you know. So the, the, this this is this is important for everyone who's a native English speaker. It's not really about being ethnically English, you know, because I, I I'm not going to get into some some other stuff. Uh, but basically, it's the cultural coding 
you know, the canon, it, it, to put it in kind of comp side terms, is the cultural coding. It's almost, it's almost you could say, the operating system of the um, uh, of the culture. And it's it's it exists. It's an external expression that's meant to. It's like I told you about history. It's meant to orient you to what's going on, why is it going on, why we're here, and all that other stuff. Um, and this is why you know when when Land was first talking about the English canon, you know, and it it kind of centers around the 17th century as its as its culmination. And he recently made a tweet about how uh, the 17th century is when anything worth caring about happened and since the 17th century we've kind of just been living on the fumes of the ideas and the concepts brought about there um and i i, I completely i completely agreed with him because um uh, our, our wonderful home state was founded seven years after the commencement of the 17th century and then he agreed with me <laughs> which is which is pretty <laughs> pretty great uh nick nick land stands virginia uh west virginians eternally coping and seething um but um, but I mean I mean and plus plus I've I've been making I've been making a deep study of the 17th and 18th century Virginia political system and, and there's a lot there. Um, but um uh, yeah okay uh, let let let's start with that. So obviously, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, you know some of our uh, some of our listeners here are not are not American, right? It, it's roughly fifty fifty. So if you could, could you explain? Obviously, you know, people know Virginia as, you know, a geographical area, but, you know, why was it a significant area for early American history? Just a very broad overview, kind of, so people know why that this is an important topic. Well, you know, v Virginia traces its origin with the Jamestown colony, which was established by what was called the Virginia Company, because the land had been surveyed prior to that point, and it was called Virginia after Queen Elizabeth uh, I, the Virgin Queen. And, um, and basically, you know, th think think about it like this, all right? The way I like to, this is a very Landian thing to do. And I'm, I'm going to kind of, you know, before I say anything else, both Henry Tudor and John D and possibly William of Orange were all time travelers, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, but basically, Virginia was set up as like this alien planet mining colony staffed entirely by mercenaries that this multinational conglomerate settled with funds in order to make a profit. Uh, that's the beginning of the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and, um, uh, and so, so that's, that's where Virginia kind of draws its origin. This is seven years after the commencement. It was the first successful permanent English colony in the new world. Roanoke was tried, I think a couple of years, a couple of decades before and it failed. Um, so this was like like the second or maybe the third attempt uh, at setting in a, a permanent colony in the new world. And it, and it worked. It stuck. It worked. It stuck. And so from there, you know, the 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 you know, the whole of the America was settled. And so Virginia, Virginia's constitution is the oldest constitution in the United States. What a lot of people from America don't know is that the 50 states all have constitutions alongside the um, uh, alongside the. Um, federal constitution that's held by all the states and virginia's constitution was is is the oldest one I, it's it's a it's like i think it's up to like 600 700 pages at this point um just full of all of this ancient law and custom and it's molded nearly entirely off of this weird myriad system of english common law that was kind of imported into virginia uh from england but uh, and, go, and go the ahead. other thing is that if you can imagine it, you know, for people at home, the the kind of two early civilizational centers, you kind of have, you know, the Massachusetts New England tradition, and then, you know, the Southern American tradition, which sort of got got started in Virginia. These are generalities, right? Obviously, there's there's specifics we could get into, but if you can imagine that as kind of the two the two threads through American history, you know, this is one of those main threads. So this would be just as interesting and just as important as examining, you know, the politics of, of, of Boston of a similar time. But anyway, yeah. you, you, you were, you, you had a point about why we were examining this. Well, yeah, 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 for sure. And this, this has to do with the English canon, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this back. Um, but I mean, you know, one thing, an unpopular take I have, and I, I say this with all sorts of, all sorts of ancestors that the Northern and Southern tradition in the sense of the gentility part of it is kind of like they, 
they kind of combined towards the latter half of the 19th century after the Civil War into what was known as the Wasps. And that's kind of when like the modern world in America started. And, um, you know, because America is a pre-modern nation. I, I made I made all these points, you know, I've made all these points on the streams I had with AA. And I'm going to kind of recom when I was talking about the sort of the idea of the Western canon before Land started writing about it. Um, I'm not saying he got any inspiration from me because he's probably been working on this for way longer than I have. My inspiration came from Harold Bloom, actually. I didn't call it the English canon. I called it the Western canon until Land started writing about it. Um, highly recommend all of you go check out Harold Bloom's The Western Canon. Um, it's the book that got me started on literature. It's the book that got me thinking about things in terms of a literary canon. But, you know, this canon is the cultural coding by which a people like conceptualizes existence. Um, it is, it is who we are to like the deepest depths of it. And the more you read it, the more you become who you are. Um, so, and this is why when I went on Millennial Woes' streams, I shilled the King James Bible, uh, Paradise Lost by Milton, and, um, uh, you know, I read some sections from Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. You know, these are the three texts which I said on AA's stream that America was founded on, that Virginia specifically, not just Virginia, the, the Boston, New England tradition as well, um, was founded specifically on, was like these these three texts primarily. And it's not just these three texts too. There's there's a whole line, you know, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Um, you know, it, 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 people are putting together, there, there are lists out there. Look for the lists. We're putting together lists, all right, you know. But the problem is with the canon, and I'll come back to Virginia in a second. I want to I wrap up that little Mark's point with a bow to give, to give an idea as to what I'm talking about here. Um, Whenever, you know, when, when Land first started talking about the canon on Twitter, everyone was rushing, myself included, because I really like Shelby Foote. Everyone was rushing to um, um, make sure that all of their um, all of their little pet works were placed into the canon, you know, and they completely misunderstand the concept of a canon. As a matter of fact, uh, the canon is, you know, I, I don't know a lot about computer science, but I'm going to talk about computer science as though I know computer science. All right, I'm going to use this heuristic. The Western canon, you called it a dialectic. You called it a, um, a conversation. You know, you can think of it along the lines as like a sort of a, a line of a, a minor operating system, a line of code, right? You want that code to be as complete and as simple and as, you know, and as, as well built as possible. You don't want it like overburdened, overcomplicated. You don't want basically a whole bunch of noise and shit. You don't want, you don't want to corrupt that code. And so you need to exclude quite literally as many works as possible, as many, um, as many works as possible. Like, 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 like if, if you can cast a reasonable shadow of a doubt onto the work it needs to be excluded from the canon because the canon in order for it to be the canon needs to be something that one person can read in um uh, in your own lifetime in, in that person's own lifetime um and and so that's why things like you know a thing can be a great work of literature and could be and could be wonderful but it's not canonical you know, a lot of my favorite authors, authors Shelby Foot included, are not canonical. Um, that's that's a whole different thing. It's a whole different ball game. Um, but like right now, we there there are certain works that you know get put in the proto canon antechamber for about two hundred years. Things like H.P. Lovecraft's stories, things like you know Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, stuff like that. So uh, Brando Johnson has a $10 super chat. Uh, what say you and Paul about the current live editing of historic works? How long till it reaches the core of Western canon where it is forgotten forever? Yeah, well, uh, well oh, go ahead. Can Sorry. I give my answer first? Because yeah, I have a, Please, please go ahead. My, my general answer is that there's always been a vested interest for every system in power to edit history, right? Now, I am unconvinced that they... Obviously, there's a certain amount of public destruction of history that I think will go on, you know, just as kind of like human iconoclasm, you know, as we shift from one kind of civic religion to the other. But uh, I, I I will say I actually don't think they can pull it off. Like, I, I think that it's going to be it's going to be viewed with the same distaste that we have for like, you know, Victorian rewrites of Shakespeare or 
you know, with the same kind of like quaint view we have for, you know, like the most rosy eyed of like 1950s and 60s history books. But do you have anything to, to add to that, Paul? Well, you know, it, it's like you can't censor shit in the West. I hate to tell you all this. Um, you can't do it. It's just not a, it's, it's the, it's the, that's what makes it unique. The, the West is so anti-censorship that like, like, cause we, we literally write everything down. We write, we write everything down. Um, and so, so even if like they're, they're selling, you know, they're selling works of the canon that with edited stuff, which they are doing. And that's actually, that's, that's what prompted um, Mr. Johnson. That's what prompted Nick Land to start writing about this. Cause he heard about, what was happening to the rolled doll works. Um, it, it, it's kind of like, it, it, it's basically deleting your own code. It's deleting your own code. If, if that makes sense. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense because you're, 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 you're kind of deleting your own raison d'etre and you're actively retarding your own ends by doing so. Um, and, and so that's why, that's why, you know, land is kind of making this whole point where it's like look the canon wars are the only reason to be right wing at this point because it's like these people are you know these people are attempting to just simply delete ourselves like like go into what is it you go into your fucking, you, yeah um, go into your command files and delete system 32 yeah right? basically yeah. yeah essentially that's what that's what they're trying to do you know and and that's and I don't mean to, I, I, I'm not a comp side guy. So forgive me, comp side guys. I know you're watching. You probably want to fucking kill me, but that's, that, that is what it is. That's kind of like how we're doing it here. This is, this is basically, this is, this is who we are. This is who we are. This is how we function. These are all our potentialities, potentialities and all this other stuff. Um, but, but, you know, I don't think, I don't think you can do it. Because you've got enough of us with libraries and with analog sort of copies that are offline and, you know, college libraries that don't even know what's in their own library and, and, and you know, and um, they won't even delete their own systems like that because they, they just simply don't know that it's in there. And the canon is small enough. It's a small enough collection of books that it um, um it's a small collection of books that, you know, you don't. It's only about maybe I think I think if you were to measure all of them, it probably wouldn't be more than like fifty books. It, it, that's 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 how much we're talking here with the canon. Like 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 it needs to be earth shattering, and the admission of a new work into the canon is not a good thing. It is a natural disaster in the same way that like a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that would be. And that's why I was talking about Marx earlier. Because about even, even like, you know, we're a little bit, what, we're about 150 years, uh, 160 years maybe after the, after Marx wrote, after the time Marx wrote, we still haven't fully recovered from the admission of Marx's works into the English canon. You know, it, it, it completely shattered existence for about a century. I... I, to me, I, hmm, sorry, I, I have complicated thoughts on this. I think that there is a, there's a major historical bias when people talk about, about creation. So I, I'm firmly of the belief that, that there is kind of a, a creative point within a civilization. Right, and there is just a time at which creation is not at its season, so to speak. And I'm I'm speaking loosely here, but nonetheless, I think that one of the reasons that history will never really need to be destroyed in kind of a Fahrenheit 451 sense is just <laughs> that it doesn't particularly matter to most people. You know that we have this there's this romantic idea that, oh, if, if people just had access to information, it would change their lives. And that's not true. Like the vast majority of people don't read. They're functionally illiterate, you know, despite the fact that they're, you know, technically able to, you know, to consume material. And so what I think is it'll just, it won't matter, you know, is that there, there will be a, a palatable kind of like saccharine sweet, you know, antifreeze version of history. Where like you, you, it's attractive. You like it, and it's of course it's poison, but 
you know, nonetheless, it, it, it fit for purpose. And I think that to be honest, it doesn't really matter to the regime if a few weirdos at the side know what really happened. We have another, this is slightly off topic, but we have another $10 super chat from Lou Templar, friend of the show. The old Syrian by where I lived used to say 99% inspired is 0% canon. For any sort of canon, it must be an avatar for the soul of a thing. Perfect avatar, no shadows, a literary photograph of the soul. Uh, it's a little bit vague, but I think I, I get what you're you're getting at, Luke Templar. There there is a point to which, like, I don't know that a, that a, that a, the canon is, and I guess that's the discussion. It is kind of like a snapshot of a living, you know, breathing thing. Uh, and then our Diddy enthusiast, our Diddy, I don't know how to say that. Uh, many R-D-T. regimes for. RDT. Okay, fair enough. Many regimes before ours have tried to censor or change history. Conveniently, the good guys have always won. Those regimes were much, much more competent than ours and may be lost to the masses for a time. However, the elites will preserve it. That matters. That's that's sort of that's sort of my point. And I honestly, I it doesn't seem like they actually really care about historical data. You know, like the, the you can still FOIA a lot of stuff from the Cold War and they just flat out don't care about it because it's a political debt issue. You know, they don't care if you know what happened, you know, with, you know, Operation Nightingale or any one of these things, because all the people are dead. You know, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really affect them. And so I think that we, and, and part of this, I think, is like main character syndrome, but like the <laughs> people, I think, want to imagine themselves as, you know, being under the eye of Sauron. But to be honest, I think that it's, right, we have to consider for the fact that we aren't enough of a threat for them to care about us at all. You know, and I think as far as they're concerned, you know, like as long as you don't actively proclaim uh, a very loudly a certain number of especially taboo historical topics, you know, I'll leave it at that, that basically they don't care. You know, there's there's no one obviously like, you know, 105 IQ, you know, sterilized, you know, MTF, you know, librarians, they care because they're, you know, they're psychopaths, they're lunatics, you know, they're, they're religious fanatics, but the people in power don't care. And so I think that it's, it is all too tempting to look at the actions of essentially like religious freaks, you know, people kind of possessed by ideology and attribute that to the structure of power in and of itself. And anyway, I think, I think that's enough on that topic, unless you have anything to add, Paul. Well, you know, I want to address both of these super chats real quick. First to Mr. Mr. Luth Templar, he makes a very excellent point um, he's been another one of these kind of kind of scholars working on this canon concept. A canon, for something to be in the canon, you know, Land talks about an angel coming down and in like guiding the work. Basically, um, that's that's what it has to be. Like like a canonical work isn't at all a uh, work of the author. You know, in the in the, in the traditional sense, it's more of like the author was picked because they had the right resources to channel it. It's like it's like they're kind of like they're a glorified sort of border gate um, from from things being sent down from wherever angels come from into our world to reveal to us a different part of ourselves that was always there and that will always be there. You know, that's that's the thing about a canon, right? Um, beginning to end, it was always there. It 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 you know all of it existed before the first word of the first you know book was put pen to paper or inkwell quill to paper um because 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 it's all always existed because as long as that people existed or as long as whatever the canon is in regards to um it 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 was it presupposed existence time is kind of time is kind of a spook and it's also fake and gay in this regard um time doesn't really have any bearing on it um it's just, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, what is it? It's like, it's like installing an update on the system. It's as, it's as though, you know, you're just adding another component to it uh, and attempting to keep it from inflating too much. That's kind of what Mr. Mr. Luth Templar, that's why you can read Shakespeare and it's alive. You know, Harold Bloom once said of Shakespeare that his, his plays read us more than we read them. Um, and I, I, that's just absolutely true. They're just, they're just such works of utter complexity and of inconceivable, uh, literary brilliance that they, they, they are consciousness changing. Uh, the Bible is the same way. Paradise lost is the same way. You know, even, even Marx is the same way. 
You know, this, this idea of class that we think about didn't exist in the same sort of, in the same place it is now, it, 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 at least, you know, it, it, it always existed, but like, we didn't conceive it. We didn't perceive it as a part of our lives till Marx wrote and it, it absolutely upended everything. Um, but for Mr. Arditi enthusiasts, um, I'm, I'm in complete agreement. Many regimes before ours have tried to change, censor and change history, and they were very much more competent than us. Um, however, the, 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 the larger that the masses get, and right now we live in a time period where I think the masses are just numerically larger than ever, and this, this may be getting into some old Yaki-ite points. Um, part of me, part of me wants to have a devil's dream hope that maybe Imperium will be admitted to the canon, but, but you know, it's still sitting in the antechamber for 200 years. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, Decline of the West may or may not be quasi canon because its English translation certainly had enough effect on the on the English speaking world to be mentioned. But it wasn't like the world shaping power that something something like Marx had. And and yeah, everything everything after Marx has been more or less in conversation with Marx, whether or not they realized it. Same thing happened when uh, Milton wrote Paradise Lost. Pretty much everything that came after Paradise Lost for a time was in conversation with Paradise Lost. Um, was in conversation with Milton's uh, with Milton's Lucifer, and even this this idea of evil be thou my good uh, is still kind of pervasive in our culture. I think that it's the it's the it's the problem with with pure reaction. You know, just this idea to to truly you know, kind of like adopt a, a mode of being from an earlier era. And, and actually the, the group I'm going to pick on with this is not a normal target of mine, but it's the, it's the people who would describe themselves as, you know, kind of like 20th century fascists or third positionists, right? Because again, like for any personal affinity I may have or may not have for those regimes, right? It, it is, things have happened since then that make that mode unsuitable right i'm not saying that you know I'm, I'm a fan of everything that happened in the 20th century far from it but the idea that we could just you know import 1930s socialism into 2023 you know 100 years out of date and it would work perfectly right much like you couldn't you you have to address Marx. you have to you know address class-based analysis you, you, in anything now just because that that once that's out of the bag it cannot be put back in it's sort of how i feel about politics as well is that like well whether you like it or not you know and, and this is what happens i think with kind of like the power creep of the state it's like okay i get it in your perfect misesian model you know a central bank wouldn't exist but guess what we've invented them now you're not getting away from that you know that concept has been birthed and I don't know, maybe those aren't as connected as I think, but it is a, you know, a through line, a through line that I've found. No, you're, you're completely correct. And, you know, this gets into another thing I've been talking about. This kind of brings us back to what I was talking about with the Virginia government's political system. Um, another work within the, within the English canon, the, um, um, the founding documents of the United States, I, I think the founding documents of the United States are a part of the English canon. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, generally, I think those are a part of the English canon. Um, and the reason that the that sort of the government of the United States, and I'm thinking specifically of a quote that John Adams said, not knowing he was wrong, that was quoted in a Yarvin article I recently read that it's, you know, the one, the hobbits and dark elves and all that. Um, another work of the canon, by the way, Lord of the Rings. Uh, it's it's still in the proto canon antechamber, but it's almost it's almost certainly going to be admitted. Um, uh, Narnia, not so much. Um, but John Adams said that the Constitution of the United States is only meant for a moral and religious people, and I think he said that because a moral and, and religious and was it, a moral and religious people existed at his time and created it. But I, I don't really think that's the case. Um, you know, I don't think that's the case. It's, how should I say this? It's, um, um, 
It's what you would, this idea of living constitutionalism as we have it, I think that exists because the Constitution is a living text. And if it's a living text, and if it's still something that people will proclaim 200 years later, and people say, oh, the Constitution is dead, oh, it's, you know, people are trampling all over it. People have been saying that for a long time. And it's, it, and, you know, you, you could argue that, that it's been edited and the amendments and all that other stuff have been added to it. Um, but you know, I, I really, I you know, this this is this isn't this is not something I just kind of came up with as as the show was going on. But you know, this is why the, the 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 governing system of the United States is so robust and is so and it's it's still functioning more or less the way it was intended to, following the shock of 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 socialism and the shock of the twentieth century and all this other stuff. And now it's the hegemon. I think it's because its entire founding basis, much like its three founding texts, uh, complete Shakespeare, Paradise Lost, King James Bible, I think like its three founding texts, the United States was founded on a very robust piece of coding of the English canon being the U.S. Constitution. Um, th whether this argument bears out or doesn't bear out, um, I, I, this, is, this is the sort of thesis I'm making. And that's why that's why I've been I've been kind of deep diving into the author of the Constitution. There's more than one. Um, you could count the Federalist Papers, maybe. Um, but you know, it, James Madison, right, is the product of this kind of two hundred year long running. I, I, by the point he was writing, it was about two hundred years, a um, little bit less of the Virginia tradition. And people make a lot of talk about the Virginia gentry and which are like this, these kind of quasi aristocrat idea that comes from England, uh, the Virginia imported Virginia tried to make itself basically as much of a copy of England as possible. Even to this day, it's, it's some, um, uh, how should I say this to, to imagine how England governed itself at the time that Virginia imported its system. Think of the Holy Roman empire in Europa Universalis four with, you know, free cities and all this other stuff. You know, if you look, look at Virginia's counties, Virginia is the only state in the United States that has independent cities that are self-governing entities. Um, you, you won't find that in other counties, um, in other, rather, in other states. You only find that really in Virginia. And that's a unique sort of English thing that we keep. A lot of these cities have no, no fucking business being independent quasi-cities, like, you know, like, um, uh, I think um, I think Martinsville is one. Um, Lynchburg is Lynch, Lynchburg's one. I know that uh, Winchester is one. Richmond is one too. So, so, so all these cities are like counted as independent cities and govern themselves independently with like a sort of county around them that has a separate government. Um, and 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 that's uh, that's why I've been so obsessed with Virginia's government recently, not just because I'm a Virginia booster, but because it's actually it's unique amongst the 50 states. And really, the architect of the federal government is really just a dude who was just trying to scale up the success of this kind of Virginia, Virginia governing tradition that that existed in the 1600s and the 1700s. Um, I mean, I. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know where much else to go with this, but like you can you can find this. You can find echoes of this in, in you know, Thomas Jefferson's early writings about, you know, I, I have the book right here. Hold on. He, his first major piece where he gets this idea of the Anglo-Saxon versus the versus the Nordic um, versus not the Nordic, the Norman rather. Uh, strain, but the, uh, the what is it? The, a summary view of the rights of British America. You know, you kind of get you kind of get, you know, echoes of this, of this of this idea. And it, it's this tradition that's been developed through um, attempting to adapt these very medieval institutions that England had prior to the age of absolutism, prior to the English Civil War, prior to all of this stuff that basically orientalized and modernized the European continent that kind of survived on in America, particularly through the port of entry that was Virginia. Um, and that's what it was like the, the U S constitution, the U S federal government was, was an attempt to scale up what was happening in, in the state of Virginia from the year 1607 till about, you know, yeah, 17, 1789. Yeah. Um, and I mean, 
I, I kind of talked about this when I went on uh, shilling my American mythos. I had a similar thesis about how American history is just the playing out of what happened in Virginia over and over again. And I, I, I think I found out, I think I found out, you know, with the English canon partially why that is. I could be completely wrong, but I, I feel like this is, I feel like this is, this is a, this is a really promising vein of thought. And I'm, I'm kind of half coming up with it on the show as we're talking and forgive me, I don't mean to talk for four hours about it, but like, like this is, this is kind of, kind of where my, my head's been at recently in regards to the whole thing. No, no, carry on. I, I'm interested to see where you're going. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I've kind of, I've kind of, the, the train reached its station, you know, I mean, the, you know, I guess to put it in a two or three sentence bow, the Virginia tradition created a work of the English canon that the U S government is based upon. Hmm. Yeah. That, that's an interesting, it's an interesting point because I, I kind of have conflicting, conflicting feelings about the U S founding documents. And I tend to get a lot of pushback on this from my audience because I am on one hand, kind of in love with the romance of them, you know, the, the, the language of it, you know, resonates with me on a deep cultural level. You know, I, I think that's because, you know, people like you and I have, you know, deliberately as well as just kind of passively connected ourselves to these, to these narratives, to these, you know, to these words, they're powerful, they're well-written, but there's a part of me that just can't get around the fact that, well, either, you know, this document was weak and couldn't stop us ending up here, or it, this was, you know, what it was designed to do in the first place, you know, and that kind of means it's, it's flawed in, in either one way or the other. And so my point is not to say like, oh, let's throw this thing out. But my point is that I think that the idea of a constitution as a document that does anything is kind of fundamentally flawed. Like, I don't believe that a state can really put limits on its own power in that way. Well, you're, you're not, you're not really thinking about, I mean, you're not really thinking about it the way I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it in, in the sense of like, I'm not thinking about it as a political document. All right. Um, this is another rule. This is another rule. You kind of have to, uh, you have to kind of keep in mind when you're looking at this, anything written, the, all of the written word is fiction. Everything that is that is placed on paper is fiction. All right. Um, what do I mean by fiction? I mean it is an artificial creation of the person who has written it or or channeled through. Right. It is there, there, I this is this is a hard idea to kind of to kind of put into words, but basically basically all this is I don't want to get into like neo-historicism. This is kind of I think neo-historicism is the school of critique that this comes from. Um, the idea that you can read pretty much any text on its own outside of its context and, and grok some things from it. Um, but like, that's kind of what I mean with it. The constitution isn't valuable so much as a, you know, as a political document, as much as it's valuable as a sort of literary piece of coding that, you know, that, um, um, the United States and as a, as a, branch of the English tree has kind of used as an animating principle. You know, it, it, every, all, every president ever, I think has broken some aspect of the constitution or another as, as, as a means of law, but as a means of like the wider picture as like, like, like the coding, what should be happening in every instance, the constitution is not really a limitation of state power. It's more of, it's more of a statement of principles or a statement, not even like a statement of principles, like, like it, it's, 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 it's coding, you know, it's, it's the operating system that the country is running on. And it's an operating system that has a lot of flaws, has a lot of flaws, but, um, um, but I don't know. I don't, I, I it's, it's lasted. It's lasted when a lot of shit that was around at the time of its writing has not lasted, especially within the, the Western context. And if it's lasted this long as the governing principle of the United States and something that everyone will always make appeals to, even leftists, look at how much of a tizzy they went up in when, when Roe was overturned as precedent. 
you know, even leftists will make pretensions to the U.S. Constitution. Um, it's I don't think it's it's Lindy enough for me to think that it's it's canonical. Um, and that's kind of my thing with it. I'm not really thinking about it as, as a piece of political animation. I'm thinking of it as almost a literary text that everyone kind of has by heart, you know. Right. I, I, I see your point there. So we're unfortunately coming up on on time, Paul, but is is there a place where, where the audience can find, you know, more of their work if they want to? Uh, yeah. Um, so so the people I mentioned on stream, check out Harold Bloom's The Western Canon. Um, if you have t- normally normally never never read books about books but this is the one thing i can make an exception for because bloom is probably he was the dude who kept the concept of the canon war when academia was he was like the last holdout of academia when the canon was being destroyed by the neo leftists and he kind of he kind of um advanced it to where we have now so check out harold bloom's western canon then go read shakespeare then once you're done reading shakespeare read harold bloom's uh shakespeare the invention of the human um, because never read anything about Shakespeare until you have read Shakespeare. Um, but, uh, other than that, I mean, I mean, check out Nick Land's couple of recent articles, why we need the canon wars. Um, some of them are paid, but you know, you can pirate them. He, he's written a couple of them. You can, I, I forget, I forget what the other ones are called. Um, why we need the canon wars was the, was the big one that he published that kind of started this whole conversation. They're, they're, but anyway, um, but, um, um, but, you know, for my stuff, follow me on Twitter at Cav King Paul, C A V K I N G P A U L. Um, buy my recent collection of short stories if you haven't already. It's called A Country Squire's Notebook. I kind of talk about some of this stuff in a, in a more fictional aspect. I try to mythologize Virginia a little bit. Um, and that's pinned to my Twitter. Uh, my telegram is called Hotel Fahrenheit. And, um, you know, I, I post stuff there occasionally. My sub stack is called the Fahrenheit Family Archives. I also write for the Old Glory Club. So that's kind of that's kind of all the stuff I do. So please check me out there. And also check out check out the stuff uh, Jay Burden has done on his channel. Um, I, I say pretending that everyone in the chat is not a regular Jay Burden watcher. <laughs> uh Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Drew, Drew Perot, who I should say, I don't know how you have more money to spend on me because he threw uh, he threw some major money for the uh, for the Bagby benefit stream. He's enjoying your book, and I will say, I've been uh, I've been enjoying it as well. And again, thank you so much for coming on. I always enjoy speaking to you, even if tonight I'm a little low energy. Again, due to no fault of yours. As far as my stuff, you know, you guys know where to find me. This show is available on YouTube as well as Apple, Spotify, Odyssey. You know, anywhere you listen to audio shows. If you want to support the show, uh, you can either do that directly, you know, with all the normal links, which are in the description, or you can check out, you know, the channel sponsor Axios Fitness and Remote Coaching, which is, you know, a company run by by a friend of ours who uh, does really good work. Because obviously, you know, you can you can be the best theory sell out there, but if you're a fat piece of shit, well, you're still kind of useless. And anyway, guys, thank you so much for coming out. See you all later, and remember, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.